The Databases for Machine Learning and Machine Learning for Databases seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Google and from contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome, guys. It's another seminar uh, here at Carnegie Mellon. So we're excited today to have Pat O'Keefe. He's the Senior Vice President at Featurebase, the only bitmap database, as we were discussing before the call. Uh, so we're super excited for him today to talk about what is a bitmap index, what is a, I slipped up, what is bitmap database uh, and why that makes it special and different from everyone else. So as always, if you have a question for Pat as he's giving his talk, please unmute yourself and say who you are and feel free to do this at any time. That way Pat's not talking to himself for an hour on Zoom. Okay, Pat, we appreciate you being here down in Texas. Uh, the floor is yours. Go for it. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for thanks for having me, and thanks everybody else for coming along to listen. Um, uh, I don't have an about me slide, but a, a little bit about me. I I um I uh, I come from an engineer, software engineering background, um, mostly in and around databases. For most of my career, I used to work for Quest Software. Did a stint at Dell. If you're aware of um, if you've been in and around the Oracle world and aware of uh, a product called Toad for Oracle. I worked on that as an engineer, um, and then eventually uh, was a VP for the for the engineering team that that built that. Uh, so love love me a database. Um, so what is feature base? Um, so I, I thought I'd just broadly cover, like, or we'll break the talk into three sections if you like. So. Um, uh, it, and the first one is it's a database where bitmaps are the are the primary storage mechanism. They're not the only storage mechanism, but the primary one. Um, one of the things that that we always try to uh, keep in mind as we build our product, because uh, we're a business, is that, that if you're a database, you, you've you know your product strategy probably should be make it easy to get data in, uh, make it easy to get value out of the data while it's in there, and then make it easy to get the data out. Um, and so that's so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then this idea, um, and this, this this probably shouldn't be a, a, a new idea to anybody who's been following this series, but um, this idea, particularly true in the ML and AI world right now of bringing the compute to the data and not taking the data to the compute. Um, and as as Andy said, if, if anyone's got any questions, you know, feel free to interrupt. Um, so let's talk about um, databases as or bitmaps as databases. So at, at highest level, um, feature base is a is a clustered database process. We're written in GoLang. Um, in fact, we are where uh, there is an open source version of feature base. If anybody's interested in spelunking the code, though, for various business reasons, which I will not go into on this talk, um, we haven't contributed back since April or so. Um, but uh, but certainly feel free to go and have a look. It's uh, feature base DB slash feature base is the repo on GitHub. Uh, like I said, we are clustered. Um, the, the consensus mechanism is Raft uh, or etcd in our case. Um, and data is sharded across nodes. Um, and, and you can do all the sort of things you'd normally expect. You can uh, set up a replication factor so that the data exists on more than one node and reads can be serviced from any node that has that data. And um, like I said, we, we shard, we shard, we shard across the nodes. The shard key is basically the, the bitmap offset in the in the table, um, which we call underscore ID. And transaction wise, the the best way to think of feature base is is we, we've come from a, a like a heavily biased analytics background, um, so we're more base than acid, um, though trending towards ACID more and more over time, mostly because uh, the use cases to which our customers tend to put us are cases where it's a large volume of data. <clears throat> they want to do uh, fast segmentation type queries. Uh, so queries with a lot of filters um, on, on pretty high cardinality uh, sort of terms. And um, they also want to keep it updated so this idea of like real-time analytics, because because you want to um, participate in an ad auction or something, and you want to do that as close to real-time as possible. Um, drilling down a little bit inside a node, um, 
sort of again three layers here. There's a language layer um, SQL over the top, which is in fact relatively new. We used to have a language called PQL or Pelosa query language, uh, referring to the old, older version of um, both the product and the company. Um, it, it, it was very assembler-like, if you like, and, and we found a lot of customers had difficulty with uh, adoption, trying to understand a, a way of querying which wasn't sort of familiar to them. So we thought, let's add a SQL layer, uh, let people reuse their industry knowledge. Uh, there's a compute layer, so that's the thing that obviously um, executes query plans when they're when they're created. And then there's a storage layer. And and I've said that bitmaps are the primary data storage mechanism, but not the only one. We we broadly have two data stores underneath. Um, and though we don't sort of talk about this quite so much publicly, but um, there's a so-called B store and a so-called T store. And the way to think about those is B store is um, roaring containers in B trees. So um, what we basically do is, is use the high order bits of the bitmap offset for a table um, along with some other information uh, as, a, as a key into the B tree. And then once you get down to the leaf level in the B tree, you get you get either the, the leaf level is big enough that we can store uh, the RBF container in page, or otherwise we'll do overflow pages. And um, and it, as it so happens, a, a roaring container's default size is 8K. So we just have multiple overflow um, containers or multiple overflow pages that contain roaring bitmap containers. And, and that's basically how we um, how we access the data on that side. That what, then, is, uh, what is the bitmap built on? Record IDs or actually the values in the B tree. So so think of think of the bitmap notionally as um, uh, you, you have a bit list and an, and an offset, and so the offset is the is the is the number so for example the way it's modeled is you have a table of users mm -hmm. and it's it's underscore id column or it's it's key column is a is an is numeric um that the actual value is the is the offset into the bit list if it's a string value we effectively just do dictionary compression we go store the string in a in, a, in another b tree to to generate the next number and then use that number as the offset does that make sense yeah, makes sense. What happens if there are a large number of values in that dictionary? So just about every string, let's say in a string column that you're trying to put into the bitmap is unique and you've got a billion rows. Do you do something special for cases like that? Or maybe you might talk about it and you could defer it. Yeah, so so I will talk about that that later. That is one specific case for which you really do not want to store that stuff in a bitmap. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I'll wait for it. Thank you. Yeah, um, and then and then the T store is basically as you'd expect. It's it's tuples on tuples on pages in a B tree. Um, you know, if you looked at the code and then probably looked at Postgres, you'd see a haunting similarity um, in in the in the implementation. So if, when I call insert, what do I land in the B store or the T store? Or depends. Can... Yeah, it depends on the um, it depends on the uh, the column storage specifier. But but um, it will always at least write to the exists bitmap in the B store, and then go write the value using the the bitmap offset key um, as the key in the T store. Okay. Um, so 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 for any tuple, ignoring replication, every attribute within that tuple will exist in only only one of those two stores, right? There's not like T stores a copy of everything. Yeah, correct. Yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't basically make a copy, though you could semantically do that at the application level if you wanted to. Got it. And then it also sounded like you were saying you're storing the you're using uh B plus trees for the dictionary as well. Yes. The current implementation we have under the hood for that is is Bolt DB, but um but we are we are uh, we're gonna switch that to um the the T store implementation at some point in the next few months, mostly because Bolt DB Bolt. has a specific set of problems that we'd like to sidestep. 
it's also dead too, right? Like the guy's not working on it anymore. I yeah. Mean, there's there's Bebo DB. There's the revival of it, but yeah, yeah, I understand the point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Keep going. Um. Okay. So so yeah. So I think two 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 storage layers. Um. So let's talk about bitmaps. So so for, so for some of you, this will be uh, nothing new. For others, um, it, it's worth going through this in a little bit of detail. So so bitmaps. Are, are sort of good at encoding relationships, right? So you have a thing and then either it's something happened or something exists or some membership of values or whatever. Um, and so we, we tend to think of that when we're storing this stuff is uh, thinking of everything set as sets of something. Um, so if you think of a if you think of a of a of a table like I've illustrated on the slide where you've got people and pages they've visited on the web, or on your website. So you can see Fred's visited index and pricing and Mary's visited index and careers. When we basically encode that as a bitmap, that pages visited becomes what we what we call, a, a in this case, a string set. Um, so it's a set that, that's, that's got that dictionary compression mechanism in front of it to turn the string into a number. And then, and then each person... Um, uh, each person gets an offset in the bitmap, and then and then basically we have a different bit list for each of the values that we see in pages visited. And so this 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 set can get very 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 wide. Um, and so this this idea of a set of pages visited becomes a a set of bit lists, um, and then each of those bit lists are stored in a series of roaring containers. Does that make sense? Cool. Yeah, this is basically Pat O'Neill's traditional bitmap, right? Would you say yeah. is it different than that, or it's ex pretty much exactly the same? Pretty, pretty, pretty similar. Got it. Um, mo most of the most of the challenges that that we've had have been. I mean, it's a very simple idea, right? Most of the concerns are practical ones. It's like, okay, so how do you then how do you then update this after the fact in a performant way, and how do you um, how do you deal with the, the concept of null, particularly if, as you move into a relational model and empty sets and a whole you know variety of other other sort of stuff at the periphery? And but the core idea, about, yeah. And will you talk about what data types you support? So obviously strings are a big part of it, but do you support floating point numbers and the whole set of data types you see in SQL, including date, time, floats, numeric? Yes, so so I don't I don't have a specific sort of slide or a table on that, but it is it is um, it's pretty simple on the on the B store side. Um, or the way to think about it is all all storage types, with a couple of exceptions, can be stored in either in either the tuple store or the or the bitmap store. We have int so sixty four bit int. Um, it it is bit sliced. And plus, you can store it in the T store. We've got a, a scaled integer, so like a, a decimal number. So, so it's also bit sliced. There's a timestamp. Um, funnily enough, the internal representation of the timestamps is a 64-bit integer, which is also bit sliced. Um, and we have uh, two variants of a set. So, the set, or what we call ID set, which is a is a set of numbers, um, which means you don't have to do the do the the dictionary compression, or we call it key translation step. There's a string set, which gives you the key translation step. Uh, and uh, what am I missing? And then there's and then there's what we call mutex variants of those. So it's a set that can only have one value at a time. So if you go and update it, it clears all the other bits and then sets the bit that you want. Um, so that that example you, you you talked about before of of like a billion row table with a bunch of strings in it um, that would be a, a string type which internally we we set as a mutex. We also support obviously, obviously non non bitmap strings in the tuple store. Uh, we added vector support and we also have uh, single and double in the in the T store. We may do a bit slice floating point. Um, but our customers, it, it's, that's an interesting one too. It has all the problems of, of like the high cardinality string, only really good for range queries. Um, and, uh, and so, 
yeah, we don't yet have that one. Cool. Thank you. Um, okay. So uh, we talked about sets, right? So relationships. So as it happens, this is, I, I used the term bit slice before. So this is the example of that. So integers can be stored of a set of, as a set of bit places, right? So if you have, in this case, a 64-bit integer, um, and you, you'll get 64 columns of 64 bit sets of bits, each representing um, a bit place. Um, and then each bit list is obviously, I talked about a, a roaring bitmap. Roaring is a, a very um, interesting technique. Uh, it gives you all the benefits of compression, uh, but you can still do bitwise operations on the compressed representation. Um, and that's sort of really what gives, it's, that's the core part that I think gives databases that do this, um, the, the latency edge on these types of queries is because you just, do not have to shift anywhere near as much data to 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 do uh, to compute on like filter predicates and um, and stuff like that. Uh, and so you'll see in this in this slide here, I'm serving two rows into a table, um, and I have two offsets one and two, and then the appropriate bit set in the bit lists. So why is this interesting? Well, this makes range queries really fast. So if you think about a query where you have a, a table uh, with this missing its from clause, oops, select ID from my table where age equals 18 and 35. So um, I'm storing age as a 64-bit as a integer. Um, the, the, the interesting part about that is we're, we're storing ages, right? So, so one of the things that we can do to feature base is, is when we create that table, we can hint and say, Hey, the, the 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 min value of this is one or zero, if you like, and the max value is I don't know 150, assuming that no human being within any time frame that's meaningful will live longer than 150 years. Um, we only need eight bits for that, right? So so um, whenever you do a query on that age column, the most the the the, the most cardinality you'll ever have to worry about is is eight, and then. Um, even better is if you're doing a range query between 18 and 35, you only need like you only need six bits to represent 35. So you can ignore everything, every every bit list um, after after six. And so you only need to read six bit lists or six sets of roaring bitmaps. And even at a billion rows, if that data is relatively sparse, um, that that can be as as uh, only a few pages that you'll actually have to go read. To calculate whether or not um, an offset um, meets that filter filter condition, and so where this also becomes interesting is filter combinations can be fast. So if you think about um, <laughs> my query, is still missing a from clause. Um, if you think about this, where you've got um, an AND in the filter, right? So the output of expression one, which is between eighteen and thirty five, is a is a bitmap of IDs matching expression one. Um, expression two is a bitmap of IDs where the credit limit is greater than 5,000 and intersecting the two is just a bitwise operation to get the, the matching IDs and bitwise operations we can we can vectorize with SIMD. So that becomes very, very, very fast. Um, so we saved IO and, and saved a bunch of compute time. Um, where, where they're slow is, is that case that, that you talked about before. So, so I have, um, if I have an integer column like age and I want to do something like select distinct age, it's got to read everything and then reconstruct all the values for every, out of all of the bit lists. Um, and so, and so if you think about how that actually works, it's, it's, I start a scan down the, down the ID list, like the offset list. So for each offset, go read bit place 63 and then go read bit place 62 and all the way down to zero. Now I now I have my number with a bunch of shift lefts and then go on to the next one. And that's and then if you have to have a key translation step to get the string back, the worst possible way to do it. So um, when I talk about this particular case, um, this is this is why we went to not not we went to the only bitmap database to yeah, not all bitmaps all the time because sometimes you just want to store a string. And, and in this particular case is one of those. 
It's I want to do some filter conditions and I want to return the user's ID and email address. Um, and so I don't need to go spelunking through a set of bit lists to do that. I can just read the bytes off the page in the T-Store. Um, similarly, uh, sometimes you I want mean, to store a vector. Quick, quick, so question, presumably, presumably you can store, sorry, do you support like author table? Like if someone realizes, oh yeah, I don't want to be, actually, let me, let me rephrase it. The the decision of whether you want to be T-Store or, the, or the, the bitmap store, that is something you expose or something that feature-based does automatically? Um, it, it's something that we expose. So you'll see here, um, okay. device user ID, string max, two per store. So um, and then I guess, how often do people realize they, 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 that they're wrong, that they, they shouldn't have done something that's is a bitmap? Maybe it goes back to my question before, where like the, the people coming to you are more sophisticated because they realize they want feature-based and therefore they know upfront they should make a decision uh, yeah. Make a decision about what the cardinality looks like. So, like, is it like the reconstruction cost is expensive, but most people get it right the first time? Is there a way to think about it? Sometimes um, we've 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 got some features in in the in the um, in the we have a rules based currently rules based query optimizer. Um, mm -hmm. We're heading rapidly towards a cost based one. Um, there's a project going on right now around group buys. To, to do stuff like well if you if you if you if you know in a group buy that you're going to hit that, that it's high cardinality so you basically get you get um uh it goes exponential very very quickly it, the higher the, and it, you don't need much so at that point what you 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 are better off actually just just doing the filter and then doing a scan and then and then pulling the whole set value out and then grouping by at a high level, whereas and and not turning it into a into a, like a series of intersect operations under the hood. The optimizer is now smart enough where it'll where it'll say, um, yeah, you really shouldn't do this. You know, you, you may maybe you want to consider making this a, a, a tuple store column, um, and it'll warn you, and and you can then just do the insert select the, to create the new column. Awesome, thanks. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously this this one you can you can specify tuple store and vector, but you can't store vectors in in B store, so we just do a smart default. Um, so that's sort of the low that, that's sort of the low level storage stuff. Um, I want to talk a little bit about sort of easy in, easy value, easy out. Um, uh, but if there's questions, let me know. So. Um, so again, I, I did watch all the videos in this series up until this point, and I've, this is not the first time we've seen this chart either. Um, uh, this this is a horror nightmare. <laughs> um, it, it's interesting to me, um, just industry wide, like how much of like we've identified all this clearly because all these things have boxes. How much time we actually spend over here still as an industry astounds me. Like you think we would have solved this problem by now, but no, we haven't. And and I think a lot of the issue is um, is you, you sort of have to make a lot of decisions about how you can implement all of this before we can implement any of this. Um, and, and I think at a, at intersection with all of the normal uh, organizational challenges you have within companies just to get access to various data sets to do anything. Um, and so one, one of the things that that, that we want to spend um, a, a lot of time with our customers was was just making ingest like as easy as possible. Um, and we, we we went through a, an enormous amount of uh, work on this when when I when I first started the company we, we didn't have SQL at all. Um, and so we built a lot of this sort of stuff. We took advantage of the fact that within each of the compute nodes, Sort of that's that slide from before. There's an executor and a SQL layer, and so we can do a bunch of stuff both on the node and, in some cases, um, deploying additional compute as necessary to to do stuff. This this is this happens a lot in our in our cloud variant. Um, so you can see here there's a there's a there's a table I just created, um, and we implemented a, a bulk insert statement which has this idea of 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 a the ability to map data from a source format declaratively, and then same thing and transform during the same step. 
And if you think of this as like effectively an execution graph, so, um, you know, source, target, a map step and a transform step, um, we can also decompose this down into an execution graph that can be distributed and in fact do. Um, and in this particular case, this was from a, a demo I did ages ago, but basically this this just takes some data out of a out of a CSV file, um, reads it re reads the text in, um, generates a UID uh, ID column, puts the text in the varchar column, and then embeds it with OpenAI. Um, the problem, of course, with this this is uh, you you'll run. That's why it says rows limit 50, because you, you're going to run into OpenAI's throttling limits really fast if you do this. Um, but this was just an example of, of, of a lot of the stuff that we built behind the scenes to make this like really, really easy for, for customers. And then with the thinking that once you have a, like a SQL layer to do, like a language layer to do all this stuff, you can put a tooling layer on top. So... Um, so you know what once we have some command line tools for example that 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 can pull data out of the kafka queue um, and then format it into bulk inserts like this and then execute them against the against the server uh, this is sort of another variant so that variant is like i, I have data in a file and i want to push it into the server this this is some this is some stuff which illustrates um, the the idea of like being able to pull from the server or the compute part, if you like, because again, um, this this top thing is basically just a table valued function, uh, which represents a remote query in this case into into Redshift, um, as pulling some product review data. Um, I can pass in a a, a, a high, like a high watermark, so. I can say, give, give me the give me the next fifty rows from this particular starting point, and then this idea down the bottom of a pipeline, so something that can be like a schema object or a, or an infrastructure object that can be created and managed separately from um, the database inside the infra, but is still accessible via SQL to manage it. And then all this thing is doing is saying, um, I, I'm I'm going to move some data from a source. To destination. So in this case, um, every three minutes, it seems, I am going to um, insert into a product reviews table the result of querying um, my product review data, like my foreign table, if you like, um, and then I'm going to do a batch apply. And so that's that's that was the solution to the throttling problem. So batch apply um, basically does a, 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 a does this function call, but batches the rows up um, in uh, in a way that that lets you call OpenAI with a an array of text and get back an array of vectors, and then it inserts them into the right spot. Um, and then you can start the pipeline by just again another SQL statement. Stop it through a SQL statement. You can go look at the system tables and look at the status of this thing running. And so again, it's this idea of making it really really easy to get data in and work with data and not let all of the um, all of the complexities overtake you because it's just a, a, a simple it, it lets you use SQL and a language that everyone knows how to use to do this stuff. Bringing compute to the data. Um, so this was a this was another variant of some stuff. You know that was obvious for customers that that wanted to be able to do this. Um, this this is a this is a contrived example, but let's assume for a minute that I have um, some demographic data about crime in cities, um, and and I just want to I, I'm a city planner. I want to build a new city somewhere, and I want to predict based on some some demographic data what the murder rate might be. And so again, this. This sort of query encapsulates a bunch of ideas um, that we have around doing this again from a from a SQL level. Um, this is sort of not new, you know, we've seen this before, but um, it's sort of really important, I think, um, back to why bitmaps to, to matter to us is that what it means is is that if if you think that oops, go back. If you think that um, the the way to 
to define the training set is with a where clause. And if a where clause is a bitmap operation that's very, very fast, it means that I can pull the data off the disk um, um, with a with a low latency query, um, push it into um, the, the the training stuff in this case for linear regression, and um, save save off the save off the um, the the weights in, into a into a system table, and I'm done. And if I want to retrain, I just um, do an alter model, and it automatically does it with the same training set. And so we don't have to run a query, pull the data out into a CSV, export the data, put it into a Python notebook, do the thing, get the numbers, put them back, do all that sort of stuff. Um, and so again, it becomes easy. And and again, um, we're trying to do for our customers training and inference in the database, or at least as close as we can get to the database. Um, not possible in all cases. So I, I, I don't need the covers. What is it? Is PyTorch or something? Something custom? So. So in this in this particular implementation, I think um, this is just native GoLang code yep. um, for a linear regression. Um, we we uh, we link other stuff for other models. So I, I think um, you know XGBoost and Scikit-Learn and all that stuff, right? Um, mm -hmm. For for us, that that stuff's possible right now. Um, Go, Golang has a specific set of challenges with sort of calling in native code um, that doesn't exist in other in other languages. So that's an issue we're, we're sort of dealing with right now. Uh, okay. I'll show you another example. L let me come back to that in just one second. Um, Wait, this just, is this so, is basically the inference of other so, side I, of the problem. Another question I have actually real quickly before you jump into the next thing is like, so you showed you're showing this model create model. You had the pipeline one before. Um, and this is all, I mean, this, this is all done in the SQL layer, which I like, but is there anything because it's a bitmap that that makes us better for this this kind of ML stuff? Like that because you guys know the bitmap store, like what how does that help for this this kind of stuff? So so the answer is the answer is I think it's it's degrees. I wouldn't say bitmaps make it better. They make some of the queries that you want to do as part of this better. When there is some higher order stuff. Um, there is some higher order stuff around um, some some rag stuff that that uh, that some other folks in, in in our team internally are doing. Where where um, I'm not intimately familiar with it, but but basically the gist is is that is that they do they do PDF breakups. So go and embed the PDF. Go chunk it up. Go and embed the chunks. Look for key terms. Um, uh, go ask the machine learning model, "Hey, what are the key terms out of this chunk of text?" And then, and then basically get back a set of strings. So that's a string set. And then we go store the string set in 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 the in the bitmap. And then one of the things that we do as part of the the inference workflow before you reprompt the the um, large language model is is go go find. So it's not a it's a similarity search, but it uses Tanamoto on the string sets. So go go find go find some like sets of key terms, and then add, add those documents to the prompt as well. Um, okay. Which is really really fast because you don't there's no floating point involved in any of that. All right, that, that's helpful. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so here's here's the inference. Um, this this syntax is going to change. Um, if you saw the Postgres ML stuff. That's a that's a better way to do it. Um, this this version here is not just pure SQL. So in this particular case, um, this is this is just a UDF um, that that calls out to Python. Um, it, well, in this case, Python it, it uses a, um, a a sandbox that basically does um, uh, uses standard in standard out to to orchestrate executing external code. Um, so that, that that's Python, but it could be anything, right? It could be Bash or Rust or whatever. Um, and in this particular case, there's some there's some stuff in the runtime that lets you do stuff. Oops, why is my thing jumping? That lets you do stuff like um, load model, and it'll 
it'll work out that that name maps to some schema object that actually has that bin file stored somewhere where it could be loaded into this sandbox before it's executed. Um, and so this particular case, this was fast text, which we trained on a bunch of SQL, and we just want to get embeddings back from from SQL that we pass in. Um, so that's so that's another a variant of, of again this idea of bringing compute as close as to the data as we can possibly get. Um, and as and as a lot of this stuff evolves, uh, we think we won't have to shell out as often on on this stuff. We can actually have it in process inside and that's all i have that's great i have a whole bunch of questions so maybe i'll ask the first one andy unless you want to go first someone else on yep. the call uh, you're the bitmap bitmap expert go for it <laughs> uh, this is uh, uh different questions uh in that bigger picture that you showed with showing how complex enterprise data ecosystem is with the query engine layer being just a small portion of it. You mentioned that the your platform's written in Go. I'm guessing all the bit manipulation stuff is probably written in C and you've hooked it up through C Go. What is that? How did you make that Go and all of this work fast with it? Or are you using some native Go libraries that let you do stuff like that? I know there are roaring map, native Go, roaring bitmap libraries and stuff like that. Yeah, so so the core storage engine is all all native Go. Um, for for performance, we there's a tool called uh, Goat. I want to say, um, and basically what what it does is it's a tool that can take. Um, uh, we've done this recently for um, SIMD stuff on on floating point opera vector operations. So what you do is you write the code in C, you write the function in C using um, in, intrinsics, and then uh, there's a post process on that which says, okay, go generate a assembler from this, and then and then you turn that assembler into the Plan Nine assembler that the Go compiler can understand, and then you compile that into Go code. Got it. And the second question is because we've been battling around with this and uh, haven't quite solved this problem. If I've got two tables and doing a join across both of those, and those columns have high cut in, high distinct high number of distinct values, so they're not going to be in a bitmap form, but then a bit sliced form. Do you do anything special when joining columns where both of them are in large like? 32 40 bit sliced land yes so so in the executor level we haven't quite pushed this up into the sql level yet so in other words there's there's no there's no um sql plan operator uh, so join operator that's aware that if my input is a is a bitmap and the other side is a bitmap I can I can just do an inter I can just do a no, bitmaps are fine if it's bit yeah. sliced so it's high yeah. cut in that. so bitmaps are fine right those are easy but if it's a uh, bit sliced columns as the join keys on both sides um yes uh again not in SQL but but at lower level we if it's two bitmaps we and it's and it's an an and or or whatever the bitmaps operation depending on what you're trying to do. Um, so if it's a quality or 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 a range, it'll it'll do it as a bitwise operation. Oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't ask the question correctly. Imagine I've got two tables and I'm doing a join. I'm presuming your layer allows joins between different tables, right? Yeah. Yep. And so, what join? What's the join algorithm if the two join keys are in a bit sliced form? Oh, I see. Yeah. So imagine I've got uh, you know a date time a, a date in one side and another date column, so high cardinality, yeah. high number of distinct values, and I'm doing a date equal to date. And I I need, you know, in on the underlying 64-bit date space, even after bit stripping all the zeros at the head, I still have 40 bits of useful data. 
Do you convert it into the tuple store version and do join in that native uh, representation space or do you do something fancy? Yeah, no, no, no fanciness yet on that. So it, it, it will, even though the underlying storage mechanism is a bit sliced, um, for a join, at least right now, they're getting materialized back to integers and then and then whatever the whatever the the join up whatever the 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 join expression is whatever the operator in the join expression is just applied to the two numbers yeah this is fascinating how far you're pushing it i love it one last question then i let others go same thing with aggregation if the group by column is in a bit representation in bit slice representation and there are large number of uh, group buys. I know you had alluded to that earlier. How do you do that type of aggregation when you're managing that group buys? And a related portion is, do you do anything special with the math? So imagine I've got a sum of A star B and A is in a bitmap form, the other is in a bit sliced form. How do you mix and match expressions? And then how do you deal with large number of Grouping key values. Yeah, so grouping grouping key values um, for a bit for for a bit slot. So it's basically the way to think about it is is go run the go go do any filtering that you need to do first because then you eliminate as much as possible. Then 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 it's basically count the bits. Um, and and so. Um, the, where the problem becomes is if it's grouped by this thing and this thing and this thing, and mm -hmm. the thing is a set, so it's not a mutex. Then, then if if it's more than a, if there's a large percentage of the rows in the table that 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 um, aren't eliminated by the filter, then you get sort of a combinatorial explosion of CPU time, and so we're looking for better ways to do that right now. Okay. Um, because it's not the way we're doing it is not ideal. And then expressions, do you do native bit arithmetic for yes. yeah? And yeah. what do you do with the two different columns? Let's say A star B and A is in a both of them are in different formats. So one might be bitmap, the other might be bit slice. Do you convert to something, one of them into something? And then of course if it's in one of those both are in the same format, then you can work out the math. But if they're yeah. different formats, what do you end up doing? If, if they're different formats, um, think of it like a there'll be a tight coercion that goes along that and then we just use native arithmetic on basically the materialized value. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. I have so many questions, but I'll see if others want to go. There's I'll fire away. All right. Uh anybody else? Uh, I have a question. Go for it. So I'm new to bitmaps and I'm just curious, like this idea sounds so awesome and it just seems like everybody should be doing it. Why is not everybody doing it? If you could some, give some context on that, I would love that. Yeah, so it, it, it's hard. Um, uh, and, and hard, I think, for a couple of, a couple of different reasons. One is um, We've talked a lot about like reducing query latency. So, so, so not only just the fact that bitmaps are particularly well suited to to some of the solving some of the query latency problems, um, if if your data looks a certain way, um, the, the problems on the other side is updating. So, so having to having to ma maintain a bit a bitmap. So, in other words, if you if you if you want to change. If you have a table with a column in it that's a bit sliced in, right? So a timestamp or an age. Um, when you when you want to go and update a value, so you know, update my table, set age equals age plus one, where some condition, right? And even if it's one row, you basically got to go to the offset in the bitmap, um, and then. 63 times or 64 times I'm sorry you have to go and basically write out 64 new bitmaps um because you can't you, you you've got you've got for that for that column you've got a bit list that might have a, like a that could be notionally a billion bits long right and so to change one row in the middle you've got to write out a whole new bit list now um, that's one of the reasons we do we store this stuff in a B tree because basically 
um, you can you, you don't you might not have to write out the whole bit list. You can just um, write out a piece of the of the the key space as as a roaring container, but you've still got to write the whole page each time. So so for an update, the minimum number of writes that you're going to do, at least for us right now, is is like sixty four pages, plus one for the exists. If, if that changes, because you, you might set that to null. So you've got to clear all the bits, then write the exists. Um, and then if it's if it's more rows than that, you, you, you're you going to write a lot more pages. And then depending, and we use a copy, at least for the B store today, we use a, a, a copy on write for the for the transaction, like, like shadow pages for the, for the write ahead log. So, um, multiply the number of pages we just wrote by two and and that's where it starts to become uh challenging and so there's you know we put a lot of time in making that as efficient as we possibly can um but yeah it's not um it's not surprising to me that it's not a widespread technique um like i said because it's hard and then one more thing to add, I think, on that. So, just the, t the technical challenges in implementing all that. I think there's there's some there's some data modeling type things that I think people coming new to this stuff um, wrap their heads around because you know everyone that comes from relational wants to to denormalize every or normalize everything, right? So you know we have don't store the data twice, um, but but for us. Um, if you're doing an events table, um, back to bitmaps are a, a way to encode relationships. You want wide set columns, right? Sure, put every um, website you've ever visited into one row in one column, um, and that's normal for us. So, so there's a there's a there's an educational sort of thing around data modeling too that 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 sometimes people take a little while to grok. It's more about identifying the exact situations in which this will work yeah. better than others, and usually yeah. people are not so so good at it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and and then I, I think a lot of a lot of our time has been spent try, trying to alleviate the user from having to do that and just making the smart decisions, you know, where we can. Thank you very much. All right, question from Martin. All right. Uh, thanks for the talk. Really interesting stuff. Hearing from a bitmap expert. Um. As a broad question, have you looked into, because Professor Patel's mentioned the, the bit slicing and we've got that form. Have you considered somewhere more than a pure bit slice, but still slicing up values? And so maybe you've got 32-bit integers chopping into two halves of 16s or so. Have you looked into any problems of that sort and... That opens up a whole can of worms of different kinds of mutation problems, of course, but just any broad thoughts on this? Yeah, off the top of my head, I mean, one one of the... I think the answer is yes. One of the interesting things about timestamps and when you think about querying them um, is, is, is people want to group around... Um, subsets of things right so so like you'll have these you'll have these scalar functions which say here's a timestamp give me the give me the month out of that and then and then use that as a as a group by or in a group by expression um being able to do that natively so so for the optimizer to say aha you're doing a you're doing a a, a constant like a constant expression on a timestamp that happens to be just Pulling a component out of a timestamp, we know that that day is in these bits. Um, can we optimize that for you? Um, we've we've given that a lot of thought um, around to, to solve those sorts of of problems. So basically, doing partitioning of values on the fly, so that the people don't have to say, "Here's my timestamp and here's my day column," and so they have to do a bunch of pre compute. And 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 storage, and then may have to maintain that after the fact. Um, I'm sure there are other examples, that, but uh, they escape me right now. No, the, the insight on the the date is really great. Thank you so much.
You welcome. By the way, Pat, that was Martin. He's doing his PhD essentially in this whole area and in uh, trying to build all kinds of crazy bitmap store areas. So he loves this space. So that's awesome to see you guys are pushing it to the edge. All right. Uh, any other questions from anybody else? Otherwise, I'll, I have a ton. I mean, Jing Nash wants probably another round too. All right. Uh, my first question is like, why share nothing and why not share disk? Um, are you talking about at cluster level or at like the storage layer level? It's at the storage level, unless, I'm, unless I was mistaken, like look like, like you were like was it was it shared nothing or is it a shared disk architecture? Um, so so right now we are we are shared shared nothing. So am I got that right? Yes, shared shared nothing in the cloud product. We are moving towards shared disk. Okay. I mean, it's, so it's like a, it was a legacy of being an on-prem at some point. Yeah, pretty pretty much. I think okay. I think ultimately, um, ultimately, certainly the goal is to is to not only move to shared disk, but probably shared buffer pool. Um, there, there's benefits for us to do that, um, even even if we have to pay a, like a, a a network penalty every time we want to go get a page out of the out of the pool, we've got to go across the the wire. Um. Uh, and one one of the other things to note too is is um. T store represents the 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 most up to date buffer pool implementation on on B store like RBF. We still use MMAP, and so we're sort of slowly migrating away from that, and then making sure that we have unified buffer pool, unified data file. Um, unified writer head log, all, all of that sort of stuff. So if you if you like it, it was a strangler fig pattern way to refactor the um, the B store storage layer, um, and most most of that's for performance. Um, we, we think we can probably halve the number of IOPS we do on B store if we move to our if we move to all the machinery that surrounds T store today. You're the you're the first person we've had ever said they want to go shared memory. Uh, are you going to rely on like RDMA or CL CXL to make it go faster, or just just regular TCP? It we we don't we don't know yet. It's just a it's just an idea. Um, yeah, and, and it may it may well be it may well be um um. I used to work at or used to work with oracles. That's why. Okay. Yeah, That's it 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 your rack. Yeah, it, racks are, racks probably a, a reasonable model for thinking about like where we start starting with. Yeah. We yeah. we we um like I said, no no firm decisions to be made, but certainly shared shared disk may be worth doing shared memory. Yep. Okay. And then um for you guys, are you using like is it a custom roaring bitmap implementation or is it based on like an open source one, and then have you ever found like its compression scheme to be insufficient for some for some data sets or some forth, and therefore you have to make custom changes? Yeah, it's pre it's pretty it's pretty customized. Um, the the most of the implementations out there are are thirty two bit. I think ours is now forty eight bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and and yes, there are there are some cases that that we find that will um that will eat CPU like there's no tomorrow. Um, once, 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 ev like once you trend towards every bit being set. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Interesting. Um, what, can you, do you know what, like what percentage of the columns in for your feature based customers are, are using the bitmap store? Is it like up to 90% or is it somewhere yeah. 50, 50? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then can you talk a little bit more about you mentioned you're using SIMD in some cases. Like, is it uh I'm assuming you're processing vectors at a time or batches of tuples. And like is pretty much all the operators, uh all the manipulations on the bitmaps themselves, does that always be vectorized? Not all, not all yet. Um, but um as time passes, our goal is to get to all of them. 
And is that is that just the engineering limitations? You haven't got around to doing it, or is there fundamental just, yeah. reasons? Okay. No, we just haven't got around to doing it yet. And you target AVX five twelve or AVX uh, two? Uh, AVX two fifty six more. So m- most of our customers are running in in AWS and Azure, and yeah. five twelve for both of those providers is not there yet. Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So I'll, I'll pass the baton to Dignesh if you want. You want to go next? Yeah, I think that workload question was exactly where I was going to go. It sounds like a lot of your applications are probably data science oriented, trying to do ETL and other types of feature prep uh, in SQL. Is that is that accurate or are people doing like warehousing workloads on your platform? Yeah, m- most people aren't doing warehousing. It's usually, it's you, not quite true actually. Oh, let me Let me rephrase that. Most people are not doing traditional warehousing. Like, in other words, throw everything in the feature base and point Power BI or Grafana or whatever at it and do ad hoc stuff. Um, no, no one's doing that, and I don't. And I don't think uh, that would be the best way to use our stuff. What what most people tend to to do is, um, or what 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 most people have in common is, is that they're trying to do. They're trying to feed a lot of changes in at the same time as do um, low latency queries out. So, and the, the nature of the queries tends to be um, small result sets. So, not mostly not big scans of stuff. It's 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 the sort of stuff if you think of like um, the traditional segmentation type use cases. Um, there's a lot of that sort of stuff. A lot of anomaly detection type driving anomaly detection type applications. Um, we, we have a customer who's doing, um, who's storing a bunch of fingerprints of, of binaries and then and then looking for patterns um, with, with CVEs um, and, then, and then saying, um, if, if, <clears throat> if I have if I have a, if I have a, like a, a, a vulnerability somewhere that's occurring in, in this fingerprint, in this binary, show me all the systems worldwide that have that binary on their system and do it for me in 40 milliseconds. Yeah, that makes sense. So a lot of IR-like work, that's what I was guessing on set value type attributes and that type of containment and set intersection type of stuff would go blazingly fast on it. Last question, then I'll stop. I know we are running short on time. Do you do any logical or physical horizontal partitioning of a table before doing any of the bit map techniques or do you treat the whole table as one big partition the the um the way sharding works is that is that um so you have the key space for a, a basic bitmap offsets each table is is um uh, when you create it, there's a number of part- number of partitions in the table, and then um, there's a consistent hashing mechanism that works out which shard on which cluster node um, that that write goes to or that read comes from, um, and and basically that's so. If you have a, a three node cluster or a five node cluster, um, the, the shards will get basically equally distributed amongst all of those nodes. And do you ever have to? worry about updating an existing value or is the model just append only or do you allow um, updates? Yeah, Take- updates updates happen all the time. Got it. And how do you deal with that when a value moves that's in a bitmap form, for example? Yeah, so so um it it depends on how many values change. We tend to we tend to batch stuff up. So larger batches are better. Um we we just we just finished a, a whole bunch of work um, with uh, around bulk insert. So if you if you hand if you hand bulk insert, here's a million here's a million rows of CSV. Um, what what you don't want to do is give that straight to the storage and say, hey, go insert this, um, because it'll generally tend to thrash a lot um, as it as it because because you'll just get dupe writes all the time. It's like I'm going to write this page, I'm going to write this page again and this page again because we're having to maintain the bitmaps. If you can pre-sort the keys, 
and then and then give it to each shard and say, here's here's a bunch of keys pre-sorted, then then that's way, way, way more efficient. So we just did a bunch of work where um, at the front end of that bulk insert statement, we we take in all the rows, we we pre-sort um, out into batches basically in in our y, in our internal Y format. And then we hand the, the pre-sorted stuff off to the shards and say, here, insert that. And that's a that's one of the ways in which we sort of make in, inserts go faster. On on T Store, um, um, it's it's basically write a new row version, and you know that makes sense. And so your earlier comment, you're trying to get closer to acid, makes sense. You probably have some sort of a snapshot isolation or some other model like that right now. Yeah. So every every request gets a transaction ID. Um, 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 anything that's not committed is not yet visible. So it's Got sort it. of, um, and um, that's on T store on, on B store. It's a little bit looser. Uh, we have consistency at shard level, but if, 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 uh, but, but you can read uncommitted on another shard from B store. Um, again, that, that has tended not to be as much of an issue as, as um, with customers as what we thought it might be. Um, just given the nature of the use cases that, that they're trying to solve for. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Andy, back to you. All right. Any last questions for anybody? I, so my last question is going to be, uh, given that you guys are a, you know, a very specialized storage that looks way different than everyone else, um, is there anything beyond, uh, you know, at, at that storage like execution layer, so not like SQL syntax stuff, is there anything that you've seen in another database system that you wish feature-based would, like, would implement? Like if you had a magic wand, didn't worry about engineering time, you, you just poof, we have it. Is there anything that you guys, you wish you had? I'm sure there is. I just can't think of it. <laughs> can't think sure. of it off the top of my head. Um, no, that's fine. I mean, you're in the weeds in your system, so it's like you know. Yeah, I it? mean, I, th there's there's lots of stuff that we'd like to be able to do better. Um, uh, like like I, I I think let me answer it this way. I I I would love I would love to have a way um, to 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 better um, let people take advantage of the strengths of this. Uh, of bitmaps in the context of a database, like the way that we've we've sort of set out to do them and do them today, without having to write the rest of the database, because that turns out databases are hard. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Of course. And then you're building one that doesn't look like anything else, and it's super hard. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's uh, it. 